<clears throat> What's the scariest animal in all of chess? You might think, the dragon, but no. The hedgehog, but no. The scariest animal is in fact the hippopotamus. And today on Game Review, we're going to be taking a look at how Nana Zignidzi uh, tried to handle the hippopotamus uh, against her opponent in the Karen's Cup, Carissa Yip. Of course, everybody knows the hippo goes e4, g6. There are many move orders to the hippo. This is just one. d4, bishop g7, knight f3, d6, bishop c4, e6, castles, and then... This is the, the signature structure of the hippo. Black does not push any pawns to the fifth rank, instead keeping all of her pawns back on the sixth, lying in wait under the water, ready to strike at the opportune moment. And then we see Carissa actually develop her knights not to the standard squares, f6 and c6, but instead behind the pawns, keeping everything hidden beneath the surface. Uh, white plays bishop b3. This is a little bit of a prophylactic move. Uh, keeping in mind that black may play d5 at a later date, uh, white doesn't want her bishop to be attacked by this pawn break. Uh, black then castles. White supports her center with c3, and now black plays knight d7. Kind of completing the development of the hippo. Some very ambitious hippo players will also fianchetto the second bishop, but this might be going a bit far. Uh, white continues her development with bishop f4, uh, black goes ahead and plays h6, and then we see uh, white do actually a, a very smart thing, uh, which is to respond to h6 with h4. Uh, so this move is keeping an eye on kind of all of black's pawn breaks, right? We see white uh, controlling the center, both with her pieces and the pawns, and so this is how she's uh, preventing these pawn breaks from black in the center. But then on the king's side, she needs this extra pawn, the h pawn, to counter the g5 pawn break as well. And so now, Carissa continues with knight f6, white continues development with knight bd2, now Carissa actually brings out her other knight to c6. Um, perhaps the, not, not the greatest way to actually get developed here, uh, when in fact, of course, this knight could have gone here in one move, and this knight could have gone here in one move, and instead both of them have in fact taken two moves to arrive at their final locations. Uh, and now Nana does something uh, very important. Uh, when you have more space and when you're playing against an opening like the hippo. Uh, a mistake some players make is they kind of sit back, they, they move their pieces forever and ever and ever. Uh, as the white player, you just try to put your pieces in the optimal squares. It's def and that's definitely one way of playing. But in doing so, you're always going to have to look out for uh, black trying to eventually break out. And that's something that black might try to do here quite quickly. Uh, say you waste just a little bit of time and you play rook c1, and black plays a move like rook e8 or actually immediately can break free with e5. Uh, and so this is what you don't want to allow as the player with more space. Uh, if your opponent can kind of break through uh, using active play like this, and in fact uh, using tactics with knight h5, and now recapturing actually probably with the bishop or the knight, now we see all of a sudden black's bishop has been freed along this open diagonal. Uh, this bishop now has some opportunities to get developed along this diagonal, and uh, black's position is actually looking totally fine here. So this is something you really have to be wary of uh, when you're playing against an opening like the hippo. And so how do you stop e5 here is a very relevant question. And Nana answered this question by playing e5 herself. Of course, after e5, black can't play e5. And this is the way that uh, Nana uh, chose to restrict the black pieces. And so because this pawn comes to e5, the black bishop will never be able to develop uh, via this diagonal, because this pawn is in the way. So e5, securing that space advantage. Uh, black takes on e5, white takes on e5. You see knight d7, uh, queen e2, supporting this advanced pawn. Uh, now b6. Uh, now white simply brings the rooks to the center with rook a d1. Black plays queen e7. Bishop c2 is a nice reroute of the bishop. And now after a5, uh, we see rook e1, uh, of course, just getting the rooks into the game. This bishop comes out to a6, and the queen comes to e3, now pressuring this h-pawn, and now black plays the move h5, uh, cracking under the pressure uh, of the uh, uh, white, pe white pieces attacking this h-pawn. Black simply moves it out of the way. And at this point, uh, Chris is actually in quite a bit of trouble. 
Uh, what Nana has done over the past few moves is really, really instructive. Uh, on the surface, it looks as though she just brought her rooks to the center, moved this bishop back to another diagonal, and, and brought this queen up a step. But what these moves are actually doing is pointing out that the black camp is kind of split. Uh, and this is because Carissa has much less space here. Uh, so, due to this advanced pawn on e5, pieces like these two knights are actually unable to get back to the king's side in order to defend the king. In addition to that, this bishop and this rook are also kind of locked to the queen's side. They're not going to be able to, to help defend the king very well. And so what Nana has done is brought this bishop to attack the king's side, brought these pieces to attack the king's side. Uh, she already has this knight, so there's a fly here. This is fun. <laughs> She already has this knight ready to attack the king's side. This knight can jump in as well via e4, and these rooks are prepared to even lift themselves and join in the attack as well. So we see the entire white army prepared to shift to the king's side, whereas there are no fewer than four pieces for black kind of locked out of that side of the board. And this is the huge advantage that uh, space really gives you. It gives you this flexibility to move between sides of the board, and then your opponent should be unprepared for at least one of those sides of the board due to this lack of space. Um, in fact, Carissa actually missed a chance here to uh, help her position out a little bit. Of course, when you have less space, this, is kind of, this can kind of be alleviated by trading off some pieces, and so that's what she should have done with this move queen c5. Then after queen e4, black can actually insist on the trade with a move like queen d5, and after something like trades, uh, white is still doing quite a bit better here, but black isn't getting checkmated immediately, which is really the important thing. Uh, so queen c5 would have been a nice try from Carissa. Instead, we saw h5 defending the pawn. This bishop comes to g5. Now the queen has to come out to c5, but white has this extra option of queen f4. And now this pawn is well defended. The queen is safe uh, on f4. Uh, but actually, this pawn isn't well defended enough. I spoke too soon. Black actually captures it on the next turn. Of course, uh, counting is, is always difficult in chess. Three defenders, three attackers. Uh, Chris is doing okay. Uh, but now, this gives White the opportunity to bring her final pieces into the attack with knight e4. And now we see all of these dark squares coming under fire. Uh, queen c6 is played. Nana goes ahead and takes off one of these knights. We see bishop takes e5 from, from Carissa, hitting this queen. Uh, Nana simply retreats with tempo on the knight. Uh, of course, you don't really want to move this knight out of the way, because then you're going to get hit with knight f6 check, and the dark squares are completely falling for uh, the black king here. So this pawn, or, or this knight staying on d7, uh, Carissa plays bishop c8 to defend it. Uh, and now uh, Nana makes a, a pretty serious mistake here. Uh, I'll let you at home try and find the best move. And uh, my, my little starter hint for you is that you need to find some way to get this king near, or get this queen near this king. This is your, your goal in life in this game. And so that's how uh, you can kind of arrive at, at the best couple moves here. Uh, they're both aimed at getting this queen into the action. Uh, what Nana did was instead play knight g3, which is kind of missing the point. You want this knight here to attack these dark squares to get at this king. All right, hopefully you at home have found the move. It is, of course, bishop h6. And then, uh, let's say Carissa plays a move like uh, bishop, uh, well, not bishop b7. Let's say she plays some kind of nonchalant move like, uh, gosh, I don't even know. Okay, bishop g7 here. Uh, the point of bishop h6 was, of course, to get this queen into the g5 square, where it can also influence these dark squares. Uh, you're not playing bishop h6, really, to take this rook. For example, if uh, black plays uh, a move, like, let's say, just rook b8, for example, you're not actually really looking to take this rook here, although white could. You're looking to play queen g5, and then you're going to take this knight, and you're going to play knight f6, and you're going to win the game. Uh, this is the idea of white's play. Uh, unfortunately, though, Nana missed this, instead playing knight g3, once again taking away a key attacker of these dark squares. Uh, Carissa actually continued the game with rook b8, and here Nana missed uh, a tactic, which is very strange because I thought she was setting up this tactic uh, by putting this knight on g3. Uh, she could actually just capture this pawn on h5, and black would really be unable to, to recapture due to this move, uh, uh, well, this, this very, very nice move, actually, bishop f6. I was going to say queen d3, of course, there's f5 here, blocking off this diagonal. So instead, you play bishop f6, with the idea being 
that after this bishop gets captured, uh, queen h6 is going to be unstoppable mate on the h7 square. If you move this rook, you're going to hit with bishop, not queen h7. And after this tactic that I'm sure everybody has seen before, uh, black would be checkmated. So some missed tactics there by Nana, but it's no worries. She instead plays the, the move I mentioned earlier, bishop h6. And after bishop f6, once again she has this knight h5 tactic, and here it's even a little bit more clear, uh, because you simply do have queen d3 now that this bishop hits f6. But it's forgivable. Instead, she captures the rook, and from here, the rest of the game is just some pretty nice technique by Nana. She brings in the knight uh, all the way to f6, takes off this dark squared bishop, activates the rooks, and here we see, uh, after some maneuvering, the rooks make it to d8, and after the rooks make it to d8, we trade into this endgame, where the rook is simply much better than uh, the minor pieces. And after rook b7, this game is, is pretty much over. The rook's gonna collect all of the pawns on the queen's side, and uh, Carissa will be hopelessly lost. And uh, so this was a very instructive game. Uh, actually, there, there were two more moves in the game, bishop b1 and a3, and then this is where Carissa decided to resign. Uh, this was a pretty instructive game by Nana, actually. Uh, pointing out how to use extra space to your advantage and how to make sure uh, against the dangerous hippo opening You don't allow uh, black to get any of those nasty pawn breaks that she's looking for uh, So once again Congratulations to Carissa though on a fantastic tournament at the Karen's Cup Of course she had some very nice games, but this unfortunately was not one of them uh, Thank you so much for joining me on this episode of game review. My name is Caleb Denby, and I will see you next time